away. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mariah Paiuchili. Uh, I'm a master's student here at UNM studying chemical engineering. It's my pleasure to be the host today for the Engineering in Action speaker series with Dr. Melanie Moses and Dr. Matthew Frick. Dr. Moses is a professor in the Department of Computer Science. She teaches the study of complex biological systems, including the adaptive immune system and ant colonies. Her research, desi her research designs efficient, robust, adaptive, and scalable engineered systems, including robots that mimic ant behaviors to collect resources cooperatively. Dr. Frick is a research assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science. Uh, he is also interested in biological computation, swarm robotic, robotics, and immune system activation. Frick is an affiliated faculty at the UNM Center for Advanced Research Computing, a member of the Moses Biological Computation Lab, and the Lab for Agnostic Biosignatures. Today, they will tell us how their project Vulcan effort grew out of the successful NASA Swarmathon project and what it means for future possibilities of unpiloted aerial vehicles. Before we get started, um, I would like to mention that we do have a time at the end reserved for questions and answers. So I encourage you to use the chat function, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen um, for any of your questions. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Drs. Moses and Dr. Frick. Wonderful, thank you. I'm just gonna share my screen and uh, hope that you're getting a full screen view of our first slide. Uh, so thank you for the introduction. I'm excited to, to talk about our work. And uh, I'll just mention, we just came from um, a, a UNM, uh, another UNM alum group and heard President Stokes speaking about her one university uh, vision, which really uh, means that we're really looking for ways to unify the different academic disciplines in the university. So what I'll talk to you about today is, is work that's really collaborative across main campus and the School of Medicine, um, the College of Engineering, Arts and Sciences, Architecture and Planning. And to me, that's really part of what makes doing this kind of research fun is that we, we get to work um, with so many different um, students and faculty across the university. Uh, so this, where humans fear, fear to tread, uh, we'll talk about how we uh, got to design ground-based robots for our Swarmathon, and then what um, we and, and mostly the students did to take them to the skies to study volcanoes. And so I'll start by giving a little bit of an introduction to the kind of research that we do in my lab. Um, our goal in this lab has, has always been to be a place that's at the nexus of computer science and biology. And so we try to set up a research environment where we can take insights from computation and tools, for, uh, computational tools to model complex biological systems that are not maybe so easy to fully understand with you know, experimental methods that biologists typically use. And then on the other side of the coin, uh, we study nature, we try to understand, um, as was said in the introduction, how robust and scalable and adaptable systems exist in the real world uh, in nature, so that we can take those principles and implement them in, bio in uh, computational systems. Uh, and in this case, we'll talk about robotic computational systems. So uh, I'm going to tell you about two projects, on, on uh, one on each side of that coin. Uh, the first one, just a brief introduction to our SimCove modeling project. And so uh, this is a project to, oops, let's see if I can make this advance, to understand um, the spread of the uh, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. And uh, we want to understand it. Let me see if I can get this to play again. We want to understand the spread, not the way that we all think about it, which is how do we how do we prevent spread of the virus between Morning, ourselves? Uh oh. <laughs> okay. And uh, instead, uh, we want to understand how the virus spreads through the lung. So this is just a quick simulation, kind of giving an idea of how we could sort of study this at the cellular scale, how the virus might spread, for example, in a Petri dish and how it infects different kinds of cells um, and how uh, in turn the T cells. Oh, seems like Matthew, maybe you might need to be muted. <laughs> We're in neighboring offices. <laughs> um, 
and so we study sort of what's an arms race between the virus and the T cells, one arm of your immune system um, that's designed to stop this virus from spreading uh, between your cells. And we can use the simulation to understand um, the dynamics over time. How does the count of the virus, the count of the immune response, the death of your own cells, how do those dynamics play out? But what we're really interested in um, is not how cells um, would get infected in a Petri dish, but rather how cells get infected in a human lung. And so this project has used computational modeling to account for systems that are really hard to observe um, in the lab or in real life. So unfortunately, I think we are all very, very familiar with a nasal swab. Uh, that's now how we all get tested to find out if uh, we have this virus replicating. Um, there are many unfortunate things about this process. One of them is that the nasal swab goes in your nose and your nasal cavity is actually pretty small. And the area of your body that gets severe infection that could lead to pneumonia, severe illness, hospitalization or death is first your lung and your lung is really big. And so uh, this is uh, a cast actually of a lung. It shows a fractal branching surface of the blood vessel, of, of, sorry, the airway vessels. And if you were to take those vessels outside of the lung and spread them out flat, which of course you should never do. Uh, but if you were to do that, it would take up the surface area of about half a tennis court. So this is a really vast area. And what we're trying to model computationally is how does virus spread over this area? How do immune cells search for virus in this area? And how does that race play out, given that it's so hard to observe? So in the, uh, I'm gonna try to move the screen a little bit. In the lower corner here, this is a scan of a patient that's actually fairly healthy, um, but has uh, about 10% of their lung is infected. Um, they uh, often, patients with COVID-19, one of the mysteries is they, they might have quite a bit of infection, um, but not even quite notice it. People who are severely ill often have really large portions of their lung that are infected. And so we wanna understand the dynamics of the growth of the virus um, using these computational techniques. So the first thing that um, we did, I think Akil is here on this call. Uh, Akil grew what I really love here is a, a branching model of the lung. So biologically, as an organism develops, its lung um, actually grows in this manner of branching, uh, in the case of a human, about 26 times until it gets to this final stage um, where these, what's colored here in red, are the alveolar sacs or the, the places where air exchange happens. Also, unfortunately, the place where lots of uh, viral infection can occur. So we took this model um, that, uh, that Akil built and um, we used it as a template to simulate how T cells track um, the virus across this really complex surface. So what you're looking at here are in green T cells of mice crawling over the surface area um, of a lung um, that's been explanted from a mouse. Uh, the airways are kind of shown here in blue, these little sort of blobby areas. And the T cells are searching for virus over that space. Um, and then we run these same kinds of simulations that I showed you before. And the result are things like these little, these red spots are showing the concentration of the simulated virus, um, an area of inflammation surrounding that that actually causes a lot of the lung damage and, and T cells moving in that space. So our most recent result, this is uh, not yet published. Uh, we just pulled this together for a recent uh, proposal that um, we'll hope we'll get NIH to, to fund some future work in this, in this space. Uh, but we're able to roughly match the dynamics of the growth of a single patient. This is a one patient shown over time, um, how the virus spreads in their lung. We're able to do a decent job matching um, that rate of growth using this model, assuming that we have this kind of complex typo topology um, that the, the virus and the T cells are spreading over. So that gives a sense of sort of the first half of the kind of work that we do in the lab where we um, use computational tools in biology. And on the other side of the coin, I will switch over um, and talk about how we use biology to build computational systems that can work in the real world. So I think, um, I'm not sure if we have spoken to this uh, particular audience before. I'll just give a quick overview of our Swarmathon project. Um, 
this was a project that we ran actually until, uh, well, actually right up until the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, so maybe that was good timing on our part where we engage students from UNM, but um, more broadly, uh, about uh, 1,500 students from around the country participated in building robots, um, writing algorithms for them, and then testing them at uh, Kennedy Space Center. So this is our group at in the parking lot in Kennedy Space Center, um, having just watched a rocket launch, which was an incredibly cool thing to be able to watch. And so we developed uh, this competition um, that I'll show you about now and, and sort of explain um, how that was sort of the launch pad for um, the aerial robots that Matthew will talk about. So the basic task uh, that NASA funded us to develop a competition to solve was how can uh, astronauts live on, the, on Mars or the moon, um, places where they will need food, they will need water, they'll need fuel, um, and they'll need oxygen. And um, the vision that NASA has to you know, get these massive amounts of materials um, that people will need if we're going to uh, explore in outer space um, is that uh, robots will need to autonomously collect frozen water, ice um, from patches that exist um, on these planetary surfaces or on the surface of the moon. And sometimes these um, sources are in, in big uh, craters like you see here, but more often they're in little tiny patches. And so how could you have a robot explore the surface and collect um, this, these resources and bring them back to a place where uh, astronauts can use them? And so uh, we developed the Swarmathon to test that. And we developed it starting um, of all places at the Sevieta uh, Wildlife Refuge and, and Field Site, which is just north of Socorro. So that's me and Matthew um, out in the desert watching ants as a model for how we might build robots that can forage for, for resources. Uh, so we spend lots of time in the, in the hot sun, um, tried to understand the behaviors that these ants use in order to cooperatively identify resources that are in unknown locations scattered out in the world um, and, and bring them back. And so this top panel here is showing a little simulation. We built computer models that we um, tested to see are these the right behaviors that ants are using to successfully collect seeds. And then we turned those behaviors into algorithms that we could test um, in simulation for robots. And then we took those algorithms and we put them uh, in robots. And so this movie is showing, these are actually not our, this is not our algorithm. This is an algorithm by SIPI, uh, Native American uh, Tribal College uh, in Albuquerque. That was one of our star teams, in fact, in the Swarmathon. And what we were really trying to do here is we had robots that could do this um, using ant-inspired algorithms. We had students develop other sorts of algorithms and we wanted to see what are the best approaches to this problem of having autonomous robots that could identify resources, communicate with each other um, to collect these resources as fast as possible. And in the end, um, there was, a, there was a, a lot of blood, sweat and tears of, of students uh, that went into this. Um, and our answer to the question are, you know, are the bio-inspired uh, approaches that we use, are these the best approaches? The answer was sometimes. We really could get more scalable and flexible approaches by mimicking the behaviors of ants. But to do really well in this competition, uh, student teams would have to put in some real, you know, sort of traditional engineering skills um, and traditional computer science skills. And so ever since the Swarmathon, we have been exploring ways to combine um, typical engineering and computer science uh, with, with to sort of augment what we can understand about how the natural world works. So uh, one example, uh, actually, let me, I will first uh, uh, let uh, the student Antonio Griego, who um, started with us, gosh, about seven or eight years ago, uh, say a few words about his experience working for the Swarmathon. Hello, my name is Antonio Griego, and I just wanted to share a few words about uh, the how, how the Swarmathon uh, program affected me uh, personally. Um, as an undergraduate student, I got the opportunity to engage in real research, uh, real software development on a large scale outside of the classroom, and on outreach and working with other students, um, building connections uh, with faculty members and other students. And overall, I would not be where I was. I would not have had the other internship opportunities I've had. And I would not be a master's student right now in the program if it wasn't for this amazing opportunity. 
Thank you. All right, so those are Antonio's words. It's it's great uh, to see he's just about to finish up his master's degree now, uh, having finished his undergraduate degree a couple of years ago on an internship at Sandia Labs. And uh, he, he was a great resource uh, for the Swarmathon, so it's it's also wonderful to hear kind of his whoops, experience with this. And I have to figure out uh -oh, how to advance. My I name really is like hearing Antonio, but not multiple times in a row. <laughs> um, so I will go ahead and advance this way. And um, so one other project that has grown out of the Swarmathon is what we are calling Swarmathon the Next Generation. So we've taken uh, the robots that are still going all these years later, um, and we are now integrating uh, machine learning techniques uh, into the robot operating system. And these machine learning techniques are doing what seems to be a simple task. Uh, the robots that already know how to go out and pick up cubes in the environment and drop them off. We're now asking them to recognize which cubes are good and which cubes are bad. Sort of the idea that one cube in this case, the one that we call the cube house uh, made in this particular shape is, is like food. We would like the robot to collect it. And the one that we call cube lock in this other shape is like poison and we would like the robot to avoid it. And so what you're seeing here is the robot's view of the world. It's able um, to use, um, it's sort of looking at these different uh, cubes. It's using machine learning, sort of cutting edge artificial intelligence at this point to identify which kind of thing is this. Uh, and if it's the right thing, it will pick it up there. In that case, it was the wrong thing, it turned away. Um, it's the wrong thing again, and it turned away. And now it sees the right thing and it goes and it picks it up. And it rather indelicately picks it up and slams it into the wall, but we call that success. Um, so that's a project uh, that's running now. Um, we have some students in a course and a workshop um, really designed to um, engage students in this, in this research process with cutting edge tools, um, but working with robots, which always makes it more fun. And so um, now we'll hear from Humaira, who is a graduate student who's been leading this project. Hello. I am Humaira Tasnim. I'm a PhD candidate in computer science at the University of New Mexico. I'm part of Swarmathon The Next Generation, which is the UNM Google Explore CSR activity. It has given me the opportunity to work on cool things like developing machine learning models for object recognition in Swarm robots. I also get to encourage and mentor undergraduate students, especially from the underrepresented community, to pursue a research career. Through Swarmathon, the next generation, I, I have obtained the chance to network with Google developers, mentors, and researchers firsthand, which is extremely beneficial for my future endeavors. Thank you. All right. And that was also Humaira being very modest. She's actually led this, this whole effort, um, done lots of work to, to begin to build a platform where we can integrate artificial intelligence and techniques. Um, all of this sponsored by Google, so we're using Google software um, into our robotic platform. All right, and then from here, I think we're going to have Hello. the same problem. I'm so here. let me escape <laughs> and move on to the next part of the talk. And this part, I think, is Matthew. And Matthew, would you like me to continue sharing screen? I think um, doing some technological backflips, I managed to get it working on my machine, so I'll be able to control the, the presentation. I'll share my screen. So I will stop sharing and allow Dr. Frick uh, to tell you about uh, where we have, where, were you, where we've been um, most recently. Oh dear. It's asking me to give permission and it's gonna restart Zoom. So I perhaps I should do it. <laughs> Oh, there, good, good. Ah, okay, good, didn't have to restart after all. All right, so can you hear me and can you see uh, some funny looking robots? Yes. Great, so as Melanie said, um, we just addressed the UNM Alumni Directors Board, which was a great opportunity, um, but I'm really expecting some hard technical questions from our engineering school alum, and I'm prepared to answer those at the, at the end. And I've got Jenner, John Erickson here, who is the PhD student involved in a lot of this work um, to help me with that. All right, so as Melanie said, um, NASA's goal is to put people on the moon or Mars um, 
depending which political party is in power, it switches back between Moon and Mars for some reason. But uh, it's clear you can't send people all the way to Mars or even the Moon and have them be there for the long term without having them use resources that are already on Mars. If you try to package up all the water, um, air, fuel, food you would need to spend a year on Mars, and you would have to spend at least a year because of the way the orbits work. You can't just go there for a day trip and come back. You need to spend an extended period there. If you tried to do that, I did some back of the envelope calculations, it would exceed the entire budget of NASA, right? Because it costs millions of dollars for every kilogram you put into the into into orbit and then sending it to Mars is even more expensive. So NASA is committed to finding ways to use water ice um, to get those components. So you can get obviously water from water ice, but you can also get hydrogen and oxygen, which is rocket fuel. And you can also get um, uh, oxygen to, to breathe. So NASA um, set up this competition called the Space Robotics Challenge 2 that we entered last year. And this challenge, um, it's on a simulated uh, moon surface with robots that we had to program. Uh, these robots had to move around the environment and they had to find different kinds of ice. So water isn't the only kind of ice. There's also uh, methane ice, for example, that's useful. And we qualified um, uh, in the competition last year and uh, the students were able to uh, receive $5,000 in prize money, which is quite a bit of pizza. So I think they were happy. Uh, another project we're working on is called NASA Mines. So this is in collaboration with the biology department and architecture and planning. So CS students worked with um, Christina Yu students and David Hansen students to design a environment where you could grow plants, specifically chili plants, because it turns out that astronauts really miss greenery and they miss strong flavors. So green chilies are actually on or being prepared to go on to the, uh, the space station. Um, so the CS students designed and built these robots that can go around and actually water plants. And the biology um, students designed sensors that fit onto the leaves of the plants and actually tell the robots when the plant is thirsty. The architecture students build this amazing um, virtual environment that could be built out of local resources. So you'd send robots to be able to sort of turn the local uh, dust and rock into these kind of environments. And then the Robots can move around and autonomously keep these plants alive, um, ready for people to use when they arrive. So this competition, uh, we actually won the grand prize, the first place grand prize last year, uh, and we're funded to continue this work. So this again was NASA Mines competition. Uh, you're gonna hear from Carter Frost who, um, Greetings, everyone. My name is Carter Frost. I'm a fresh transfer student here to UNM. In my community college, I got involved with the Career Robotics Club uh, and was doing the NASA Swarmathon competition that was put on by UNM. It was a great opportunity for me and my fellow students to work as a team on robots with a shared goal in mind. The high school outreach element of it pushed us to share the robots uh, and our experience, which I then uh, continued to do with engineering camps and scouting. I was asked to join two of UNM's NASA robot teams, of one of which we qualified for the finals and the other one we won first place. I'm currently involved with the Vulcan uh, Dragonflies project as well as the uh, Swarmathon TNG uh, team. UNM has given me a lot of opportunities to be able to grow and to share my experience with others. Greetings, everyone. My name is Carter Frost. I'm a... All right, so yes, the volcano part is coming. There's a, a chat question about that. Um... All right, uh, so what Carter's talking about there is um, we created a hundred of these swarming robots that are out in the world, different universities, at different minority serving institutions. And so that raises UNM's visibility. And, is and we have students interested in coming here specifically because they were involved in Swarmathon. So that's been a real success. So we've been able to recruit, recruit people like Carter who have been huge assets to continuing projects. I want to talk um, really quickly about uh, Raven Duval. Um, she is a NASA intern, or was a NASA intern, who worked on Swarmathon 3 um, and is currently the deputy program manager for the IRIS rover program at Carnegie Mellon. And this rover is scheduled to go on the Pegasus mission to the moon this year. It's a done deal, it's really going. And uh, that's her on the right 
of my screen with um, a Swarmy. And there's the robot that she and I have to admit 200 other <laughs> Carnegie Mellon graduate students worked on and built to make it moon worthy. But we're super excited that that descendant of the Swarmies is really gonna be driving around the moon, um, doing exactly what Swarmies were designed to do. I reached out to her yesterday and I was a little bit worried now that she's famous, that she would not remember her roots, but she immediately said, no, no, Swarmies were the inspiration for what I'm doing. This is where I started and I'm super happy for you to, to, to give me a shout out. Um, that mission, by the way, is gonna be the first US mission to the moon. And it's also the first commercial mission um, in history. So NASA partnered with um, private companies to take that, that step, a really important step. All right, so um, having seen uh, news reports about the Swarmicon competition and our autonomous robots, Tobias Fisher, who is now our collaborator in the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department approached us and said, right now we're sending people to go gather uh, gas samples from volcanoes, it's incredibly dangerous, it's slow. What can your swarmies do? Can they, can they do this job? Because they're designed to go into hazardous environments on the moon, Mars. Um, we've got our own hazardous environments on Earth, they're called volcanoes. So we said, yeah, that sounds like an amazing, amazing opportunity, challenge. Um, maybe not ground robots, maybe flying robots would be able to deal better with volcanoes. And so that's what we've been working on. Um, we took a preliminary mission out into Papua New Guinea a couple of years ago. This is with, I think, 10 other international teams, places like Cambridge University, universities from South America and Germany. Um, and they all brought their own drones. These are all manually piloted. These were not autonomous drones, like this one was our autonomous robots. Of those teams, only one drone made it to the big volcano and survived, right? So some drones made it up there, most of them got destroyed. The main lessons we learned here was this is really hard. Right? You're dealing with mountains, high altitudes, you know, lava bombs, acidic gases, remote areas, and you know, anything you could name, right? Uh, it's already a big enough challenge. Um, so we got to work and we started designing and building the Dragonfly robot to meet this challenge. So in my mind, um, and I have to say that John Erickson has done a tremendous amount of work, but from a bird's eye view, in my mind, they're flying swans. Right? I don't want to undermine him at all by saying that. Um, that's a compliment. Uh, so swarmies were designed to go out their environment and find clusters and concentrations of these target cubes and collect them. They do that with a camera, right? They see the target and they collaborate with their neighbor uh, robots to figure out where the biggest concentrations are. We replace that on our Dragonfly robots with a CO2 sensor that enables them to detect concentrations of CO2, talk to their brother and sister robots and figure out, okay, where are the highest concentrations of CO2 um, that we'd like to sample? And the reason we want to get CO2 is because you can tell a lot about what's happening with a volcano, both make predictions about its future and also explain what's happening right now from the CO2 emissions. And of course, there are implications for climate change model. It's really important to understand how much CO2 is coming out now and how much CO2 is, has been out in the future. All right, but otherwise, there are a lot of parallels. They both have GPS systems, they know where they are. They both have range finders. The swarmies don't run into walls and the dragonflies don't run into the ground. And they both have high capacity batteries because these are serious long range missions where you want to have at least an hour of, of operation time. But most importantly, they all run the robot operating system. So everything you've seen on the robotic side has been run on the robot operating system, which provides a consistent platform and means of communication between robots for all these projects. So we can quickly take our ideas, implement them in a common system, and then tackle all these different challenges. So I think that's really important. All right, so uh, many people in New Mexico don't realize that we have an active supervolcano in northern New Mexico. We don't expect it to erupt anytime soon, but it is active, which means it's a perfect place to go and gather CO2. The CO2 is coming out of the ground there. Uh, this volcano is 30 kilometers wide or so. If it does erupt, right, we all need to care. Sometimes people ask, um, why do people live near volcanoes? Well, surprise, we all live very much in the blast zone of this volcano. And so understanding its, its future and its current activity is important. 
In fact, I think 40%, um, I read in a paper somewhere, 40% of people on the planet live in within the blast zone of volcanic country. All right, and it's, it's a perfect place for us to test our, our drones. So here they are. Um, this is near Jemez. We've got three dragonflies flying in formation. They are all detecting CO2. And by taking those three different readings, the swarm can collectively decide what's the gradient towards the highest concentration of CO2. And you can see up there on the map in the upper left, um, the track of these um, dragonflies as they approached indeed the highest concentration of CO2. And these results have just been accepted. We're just looking at the final proofs for publication in uh, Frontiers Journal. Ah, I'm gonna slip, okay. Uh, but our test role, not always successful, right? This is part of the learning curve. Um, every time something goes wrong with a swarmy, you know, you can walk over and maybe kick it and it starts up again. With a dragonfly, if something goes wrong, it's done, right? It's, it's, it's gonna crash and, uh, and John needs to go back to the garage and, and start building more, more dragonflies. That's why whenever you see me showing a, um, oops, there we go. Whenever you see me showing a video of drones landing, we're all breathing a huge sigh of relief because we've been standing there with our hearts in our mouths, watching these autonomous robots do their thing and hoping that they come back from the mission successfully and uh, we don't have to spend a lot of time rebuilding them. All right. We also did um, work in Roosevelt, so more testing um, in different environments. So you can see lots of gas coming out of the ground here. This is another volcanic spot. Uh, you can't see the CO2 again, that's invisible. So we need to have the robots discover that for us. And here is a, a dragonfly performing an exhaustive survey. Uh, you can see all these dead trees and this desolate landscape because the sulfuric acid, gas, sulfur gas is coming out of the ground that killed these trees. And partly, I just, I'm always stunned by the landscape here. This is uh, in Utah. And the fact that the drone is doing exactly what it was designed to do. All right. So this is all last year. Um, I think it was April or so that we were in Roosevelt. And Tobias came to us in September and said, hey, there's a new volcano that's erupting right now. It's extremely active in the, in the uh, Canary Islands on the island of La Palma. How fast can you get out there? So the previous missions we had run, maybe a maximum of 100 meters or so, a couple hundred meters that the that this dragonflies had flown. To do this, we would need to fly for kilometers. Right? So we scrambled and we managed to get out there in about two weeks, three weeks from when we heard about this volcano. And this is what we're faced with. This is um, a new volcano, again, People ask, why do people live near volcanoes? This volcano did not exist before September of last year, right? This, there was no mountain here. This is how the earth forms, right? We rarely see it, but new land was forming. Um, and it's just an inspiring, awesome spectacle. It is also extremely destructive. So on the right-hand side of the screen here, we've got um, the volcano and lava has flowed down to the ocean for about four miles. Uh, through a large number of, um, sorry, and I click the admit button in Zoom, it throws off the, the presentation. Anyway, uh, there's lots of towns here. So this volcanic eruption destroyed 3,000 buildings, caused more than a billion dollars of damage, and one person sadly died um, over a period of three months. And this is what that looked like on the ground. You can see on the right, um, on the left, sorry, the mass of that volcanic lava uh, just sweeping everything out of its path. If you've ever wondered what it looks like when lava falls into a swimming pool, now you know. Right. And this is John and my first view driving into town uh, and seeing this, this volcano in the town. It's, it's as if a volcano had popped up you know, it's central in Manal, right? And, you know, people had to deal with it. So with the ash falling and the lava destroying everyone's homes, 
people in these towns were getting kind of fed up with this volcano. <laughs> and they really wanted to know, could we tell them something about how long was it going to last, this eruption? Uh, so you can see the, uh, the volcano here, lots of ash and various other gases coming out, all visible. Uh, again, the CO2 plume, we can't see. So it turns out that you can tell a lot from the CO2, as I mentioned earlier. Primarily, um, the CO2 isotopes that exist deep in the Earth are primordial. That means they came either from star formation or from the Big Bang, the Big Bang itself. Uh, it's not the organic atmospheric carbon that you and I breathe out all the time. And so by looking at the ratio of the primordial carbon dioxide and the atmospheric carbon dioxide, you can estimate how deep the magma that's feeding the volcano comes from. And from that, you can make some sort of estimate about how intense is this eruption? Because the deeper the magma, the deeper the magma is coming from, the more likely it's going to keep on coming. If it's a shallow magma chamber, maybe it's going to empty relatively quickly. And also you can look at the SO2, CO2 ratios and even predict eruptions. So there are papers about predicting eruptions from these ratios. So our simple task is to send a drone up into that monster volcano's plume, sample gases, return them to the geologists, and uh, they can tell us what's going on. This is our first launch near the volcano. And you know, as I said before, scaling up from 200 meters to kilometers, while the drones are flying through ash, rain, acid, who knows what else is up there, and the fact that we can't do anything about it because they're out of sight, right? Before this, we could always keep an eye on the, on the drones. Now they have to go off, fly for half an hour or more over kilometers, and we just have to trust they do their job and come back. And so we would stand there. I'm, I don't know if it's, I'm sure um, everyone was as stressed as I was, but it was definitely, <laughs> again, uh, quite stressful. But it came back. I'm, I'm going to let this video play so I can relive the moment where the drone actually came back and we hadn't wasted all the money and time going out there for the plumber and we had the results. Uh, if you look at this video, um, you can see ash and rain falling. Uh, that's what all that sparkling effect is. And it even found the plot, right? So this is the, the plot of CO2 um, concentrations over time. So it successfully found that CO2 plume that's invisible to us. And you probably didn't catch what um, John was saying there, but he said, hey, I didn't have to do anything, right? The drone landed itself, did the mission. He was ready to take over in case something went wrong and he didn't have to. Uh, so one thing to realize, and it's hard to see in these videos, of course, we had only ever flown these drones in maybe what, 12, 15 mile an hour winds. And even then we were really nervous. We're like it's so windy, we can't do this. The winds that these drones are flying in now around the volcano were up to 40 miles an hour, right? So more than twice what we'd ever flown in before and they handled it beautifully. And that's all down to the, the months of tuning that John did to make sure they could handle these really difficult conditions. Um, we also uh, collaborated with a team, uh, Inat Lev from Columbia University on measuring um, lava flow rates. So she develops models of lava. And to do that, she needs to know what's the viscosity of these lava flows. So I flew a drone out um, over the lava flows. It's really hard. That's one of the big lessons from Papua New Guinea and Canary Islands is perspective is really impossible because you know, we have no experience with the newly formed land that's appearing here. So I thought maybe this is, you know, 10 meters long or something. When I was looking through a little viewfinder, um, I'm going to back it up actually, because that in the lower left-hand corner, let's see, that, that's a house, right? That's a house that's been buried in lava. And so this is not 10 meters, this is hundreds of meters. Right? And that's one of the reasons why autonomy is important. You need a robot who can go out there and do the job and respond to the environment because human operators really have a hard time with this. All right. Another lesson we learned um, is that volcanoes change very fast. They really do have a personality. 
So um, this is uh, one morning we arrived at our uh, usual launch point to find that the volcano had opened up a new vent on the flank and a lava lake had formed and was now overflowing. Uh, this, is our, this is our previous launch site taken the day before. And this is our launch site when we came to work there in the morning. Um, so as you might be able to see, it's entirely inundated with a new lava flow, which meant we had to launch from somewhere else uh, and have our drones fly even further than they had before. And rely on them being able to autonomously still do the work. Oh, I see that Marlon is joining the meeting and he was actually really instrumental in getting and overcoming one of the biggest challenges we had, one of the biggest hurdles we had was how do we get batteries for these drones to the um, Canary Islands? It turns out that's incredibly difficult because you can't take large batteries on airplanes, you can't ship them, you can't do anything else. So we had to design batteries that could be specially broken down to be below the hand luggage limits and then convince um, security at every airport went through that, yeah, this is, this is fine, this meets the regulations. So Marlon is the guy who broke down some of those batteries for us. And so we really owe him uh, thanks. All right, so we changed our launch sites. And uh, this is Scott Nowicki, a geologist who was with us. And there's John. Um, we ran some missions that morning that identified where the plume was that morning. And now we've put some sample bags onto the Dragonfly. So it's gonna fly out there, find the plume, take, suck up the actual volcanic gases in the plume, return them to us, we can give them to uh, the geologists to study. And this is a one shot, right? This is our last day of real work. Um, if this didn't work, we get some results, but uh, we wouldn't have the results. Every time we went into the field, we had to be accompanied by military um, police, military emergency responders. So, you know, these are very short windows we're allowed to work. And again, it went off with its work. Here it is landing. Uh, we don't have cameras on the front itself. I can put it in between there. So there are two bags on here, two sample bags, and one of them inflated and got the samples we needed. It turned out to be just enough for the analysis of the isotope ratios. Um, one of the sort of experiences we had was sending these drones off to do their work. You had to kind of imagine what they were doing out there, right? Because they do have routines that tell them to return to home or how to deal with emergencies. Um, you don't know what emergencies they're handling. And there are lots of times where a drone return early or in a different place than we expected. And you kind of wonder what was the story behind that, that drone's encounter with the volcano? Um, and so we definitely will spend a lot of time, I think, adding more logs and adding uh, cameras so we can share that, <laughs> the adventures of these, of these drones um, in the future. All right, so what, what, what did we learn scientifically? Uh, so collaborating with the, um, uh, the Canary Islands volcanologists, the Canary Islands are part of Spain, that's why uh, these figures are all in Spanish. Um, we found that the isotope ratios of CO2 corresponded with previously measured isotopes in deep sea rocks that are thought to come from 65 kilometers below the surface. So we infer that the magma coming up and producing these CO2 ratios is probably from that depth, which is really deep. And it might explain why this eruption was so violent and why it lasted so long and did so much damage. Um, I wanna share uh, Abby Pribasova's um, point of view. She's a, a really stellar student who joined the lab as a high school student and has, um, has developed and is involved in all kinds of projects now. And we're hoping she'll stay here for graduate school. Uh, let me let her speak. Hello, my name is Abigail Pribasova and I'm a junior studying computer science at UNM. Swarmathon has been a huge part of shaping my academic and career path. In the summer before my senior year of high school, I attended the School of Engineering Energy Summer Camp, where Matthew and some grad students demoed the Swarmies. 
Obviously, I was fascinated with the robots, and despite having virtually no programming or robotics experience, I asked and started interning at the Moses Lab. Through this, I realized how much I loved computer science and the Moses Lab, so that's largely why I decided to attend UNM and study computer science. The lab has given me the opportunity to participate in some other projects, one of which led to me being named a 2021 Goldwater Scholar. Also, through Swarmerth on the Next Generation, I was able to gain some experience with machine learning. I get a year-round undergraduate internship at Sandia and applied machine intelligence the summer of my freshman year. I'm grateful to the Swarmathon, the Moses Lab, the School of Engineering, and the CS Department for bringing me where I am today, and I look forward to continue working with these wonderful people. All right. So with that, uh, I want to acknowledge all the faculty and students who are involved in these projects. Um, we collaborate with theoreticians, biologists, uh, a whole host of people. And I think that's really been really valuable. And as Melanie said at the, right at the top, that's uh, President Stokes' vision for the university is more collaboration um, so that we can, we can cross those field boundaries and accomplish more. All right, so I have to show this one last video. Uh, I did not take this video. This is from an Italian pilot who's there right at the start of the volcano. But this video is just too cool to not show. And it's short. So it might give you an idea of what the dragonflies are experiencing when you're up there out of sight dealing with the volcano. Uh, we did lose uh, Dragonfly 3. Um, they made an unscheduled landing right about here. And we decided maybe we shouldn't pick out the of the water. But that's the point of the dragonflies, is they're expecting to All right, so that is a really exciting video. Um, I am ready for questions, but while you all are asking questions, I want to show you another side of the volcano, which is really relaxing. So after a hard day's work with the drones, we go and sit by the lava river, you know, and uh, and relax because it's, you know, it sounds like a fire. It was freezing rain at the time, so it's nice and warm, and it's you know, just watch it slowly drift by. Right, questions. Great. Well, um, thank you both for sharing your incredible work with us. Um, as Dr. Frick mentioned, we'll start the question and answer portion. Um, so again, you can use the chat function that's at the bottom of your um, Zoom window. Um, but we do have a few questions just to kick it off. So what was the biggest challenge traveling to a volcano? John, do you want to handle that one? Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, excellent presentation, guys, uh, first of all. Um, really encapsulated our, our efforts out there. And uh, yeah, biggest challenge, I'd say, traveling out there, uh, I think Matthew talked about this was, uh, I guess, the logistics, mainly around handling batteries and preparing for that. Um, I wanted to actually just ship them out and get someone that would receive them on the other end. But it uh, turns out that shipping lithium-ion batteries, especially big ones, is... There's a lot of regulations around this. There's a lot of costs around actually getting it through different airports and internationally. It's it, it's almost a non-starter. You almost can't even do it uh, without you know a lot of preparation and, and contracts in place. So with the short lead time we had, we <laughs> uh, just decided in the end we 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 were going to hand carry them over. And honestly, uh, TSA and everyone else didn't even bat an eye for the most part. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, it's almost expected that we, we carry them. In fact, uh, I got stopped by TSA, uh, I think in Germany on the way back. And uh, I was like, oh, finally, they're gonna check out the batteries. And no, they pulled a tube of toothpaste out of my backpack and said, you can't have this. <laughs> and stuck it in the garbage can. I'm like, I guess that's my uh, dental hygiene for. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that, I'd say that was the biggest challenge other than I guess, yeah, just the, long-term uh, travel going out there. And just to yeah. add, so go ahead. Oh yeah, I'll just, I'll just chime in to say, um, Matthew mentioned that Marlon helped with, with 
decomposing these batteries into small packets. Rafael gave us advice. Rafael Fierro, who is an integral part of the Vulcan team, who's on the call, um, faculty in the School of Engineering. Uh, Tammy Arkey is, is on the call. She was the person who negotiated all of these purchases and you know extra airline things. So I just want to highlight that uh, the logistics were really tough and it was just fabulous to have a, a UNM team behind us um, without which I think we never would have, the team never would have made it to the Canary Islands. That, that's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. I was just gonna quickly add that um, once we got there, right, this is a volcano. And so people aren't supposed to be going up to volcanoes. And so we spent a lot of time and worked very closely with Invulcan, which is the, uh, the Vulcan monitoring site on the Canary Islands. And they were able to negotiate with emergency response teams to let us accompany um, the military emergency response groups that went out there. I think by the third or fourth day, they trusted us and they left us alone. But it definitely every day we're worried, not only are the drones going to work, is the volcano going to kill us all? You know, is, is this all going to work? But can we even get there for all that to happen because of the roadblocks, et cetera? Wow. Well, I'm, I'm glad everything worked out. Um, looks like we have another question from Robert. He asks, uh, does the wind from the propellers affect the CO2 concentration? Great question. We did some experiments to investigate that. Um, yes, the answer is yes, but on a, such a small scale compared to a volcano that it doesn't really matter too much. That's the short answer. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see, one from Kim. This looks like an intense and dangerous project. What was the scariest part of the mission? Scariest part of the mission, that's a good question. Um, Missing our flights, <laughs> right? I mean, every, every, or being stopped uh, without, you know, the scariest part for me was we were going to get out there, but our batteries were going to be confiscated. And so we're, we're just going to have to sit on the beach, you know, spending UNM's money. Um, so I was really excited when it was over that it went as well as it did, because a million and one things could have gone wrong that would have prevented this from working. And it's just, as Melanie said, a testament to all the hard work from the administration at UNM, getting it to go, and, and John's hard work so that it all came off so well. I'll chime in on this one too. And uh, yeah, I, I, agree, I agree with Matthew 100%. Like so many people were involved, and for all the dominoes to fall here, that it's, it's really a wonder that everything went as smoothly as it did. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, we, we had special access to uh, the volcano to a, 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 a position near the volcano that Invulcan had. And they wanted to show us like what the volcano was actually doing. And I'll tell you, this thing was impressive to say the least. Uh, first of all, the landscape is nightmare inducing. You've never been on a landscape like this before that's just, just suffocated by ash, but also this, this active, like large source of energy nearby that's loud and is doing something that is very dangerous. Um, I guess that was the most dangerous part of the mission, but the scariest part of the mission, uh, I'd say for, 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 for me at least. So, so John, you reminded me of something, which is I was the only person insured to drive the Jeep, right? So we got this great Jeep, it was really wonderful, but they had me drive up to near the volcano and, and volcanologists always park with the nose of their vehicles away from the volcano. So they can quickly get in and drive away. So I'm driving over what used to be a road, but is now sort of like snow drifts of ash. So I'm sliding all over the place. And one of the Invulcan persons, people says, oh, it uh, looks like the poisonous gas level is, is, is increasing. Could you drive a lot faster? And so I'm like, you know, looking at a precipice on one side on the snow drift in a, in a Jeep, just trying to keep it together. But we, we're here to tell the story, I guess. Great. Um... So we have one from Ranjit. He says, hello, or hi, I, I have an idea for extending range of your batteries. Uh, what is the current status? How many minutes of flying time available? Uh, it's about an hour, but it depends a lot on altitude and other factors. We, we're doing some theoretical work to try and extend that time um, by reducing turning. Uh, but again, John can speak in more detail about that. Yeah, so that, that's accurate. I think they're in, uh, La Palma, it was about something like 40 minutes. Um, just depends on the yeah, conditions. I think wind was really a factor in those in our battery life out there. Um, but yeah, I, I think in general, we're always interested in new ideas. So 
Uh, if you want to contact, I guess, Matthew or myself or anyone on the project, we'd love to hear your ideas. So. Cool, thank you. Um, let's see, we have one from Doug. Next time, maybe ask Noah for travel support. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. Yeah, all right. Um, I actually have a question for Dr. Moses. Um, I know uh, the, I guess the robots were mimicking ants. So I was curious, were there any other animals or insects that were kind of prospects as well? Yeah, great question. In fact, um, uh, the other organism that we took some inspiration from was actually plants. Uh, so one of the algorithms uh, that John has actually been developing started as, um, you know, we were looking for an efficient way to fill space, right? To start in one spot and to go out and come back and go out and come back um, and really sample a large area efficiently in the, because we're always limited um, as Rajit's question implied, we're always limited by the flight time. So how could we do that in the most efficient way possible? Um, it turns out uh, sunflowers do this. So if you look at uh, the pattern in a sunflower or the pattern in a pine cone, um, in you know early CS classes, we often learn about the Fibonacci sequence, right? A sequence of numbers, right? Where you, you create the next number by adding uh, the previous two numbers. That sequence is used by plants, a variety of plants to fill space efficiently. And we actually used that um, same mathematical formulation uh, to develop an algorithm um, to, to, to cover space. And that was part of the impetus of one of, of John's algorithms that we didn't manage to get that going yet in, uh, in the Canary Islands. But um, when we have multiple drones trying to survey an area, um, that's, that's something we, we hope we'll be able to go back to. So na nature's surprising in a lot of different ways. I would not have, uh, I, at the outset, I wouldn't have thought we would have found efficient algorithms by, by looking at, you know, growing sunflowers. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, great, well, um, I think that concludes today if there are no further questions, but uh, thank you again, all of you for joining us and uh, thank you to the audience for listening and enjoying this. Um, so yeah, uh, go Lobos.